Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today we are talking with Ethan McGuire, and we have a really good talk, and we talk about all sorts of stuff. So to give you a little a little tease, a little foreplay here, we're going to talk about MFAs, workshops, um, being a working writer, uh, what COVID did for writers, the importance of getting thrown into the deep end, the art of promotion, publishing being evergreen, um, the Amazon algorithm, family reading your work, death of the author, and then we're also going to be talking a little bit about Ethan's new book of Christmas and wintry poems. Just so you know, too, Ethan um, is a... Uh, supporting writer in um, this upcoming issue of Bloodshed Review. Um, It is number four, and um, there are a lot of amazing people in it. So that's what's going on um, as far as this episode that you are going to be listening to momentarily. But first, for those of you who are watching the video feed, you might be looking at me thinking, what the effing H-E double hockey sticks is going on with your face? Okay, so for those of you own, or for those of you listening, you you can't see, but um, I have gutted out my beard to where I just have a big giant old timey mustache here that goes all the way up my fucking face. I did this for the whole Movember thing. So before we go any further, I just want to talk about it few little things here. Men's mental health is a thing that is very serious and things and something that we need to take seriously, obviously. So for any of you out there, you're not alone, okay? If you're feeling down and you're feeling kind of at the end of your rope, you don't have to pretend to be strong right now, okay? Everyone goes through some kind of depression or dark times, whether it's situational or it is completely chemical in your brain. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. It does not make you weak. It does not make you less of a fucking man. Okay. If you're worried about being a man about this, the most manly thing you can do is take care of your shit. And the best way to do that is to seek help. Okay. I don't know if every state has this, but California has a warm line that you could call up to three times a day for free and talk to somebody about what's going on with you, okay? And they can also like kind of steer you in the right direction to get um, the help that you need. And I mean, shit, if you have fucking insurance, why not fucking get some help, you know? Like, that's what it's fucking there for. And you're not going to have to fucking pay for it or you're going to pay very little for it. And then if you don't have insurance, um, there's always better help. Um, It might take you a minute to find somebody that you like talking to, but this is what you do. And it's the same thing with your car. If you take your car to an auto shop and they charge you too much or you don't like the feel of the dude, you'll fucking go and take your car somewhere else because that's what you fucking do. So don't let yourself get so far gone that getting help seems way too far away. And if you have people who depend on you and people who love you and care about you, like you owe it to them to not let yourself go. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want to get too tough love here on this, but it's legit. And then for those of you who are like, your mental health is fine, but God damn it, you haven't got that prostate exam that you've been hankering for. Get that fucking shit, dude. Like, I know it's embarrassing to like pull your dick out in front of a doctor, but you know what? The more you pull your dick out in front of a doctor, the easier it gets. Do you know how many fucking medical professionals have like fucking played with my nuts and shit? Tons. Okay, and it's always a little weird, but once you take your pants off, everything's kind of fine. It's like most sexual experiences. 
like the the oh god, I'm gonna have to take my pants off. It gets a little weird, but then once they're off, everything's good. And then next thing you know, someone's cupping your junk. You know what I'm saying? So it's fine. And like even like colonoscopies, like these are things that people of our age need to get, and even people younger. Like seriously, like if you're, I, I would say if you're over thirty, you need to get completely like done up down there like get your balls i mean even if you're younger than that you need to be checking your nuts for fucking like extra nuts you know what i'm saying so squeeze those bad boys okay take a look at all this shit and um see a fucking doctor it's what it's what they're there for Okay, don't be one of these people. I just talked about this in the video I did where... Because I did a video where I fucking gutted my shit out here. Um, I've had two friends in the last year um, die from colon cancer. And neither one of them knew they had it until it was way too late. And both of them died within a month of finding out that they had it. Okay? So, I know that most men feel like... No, nah, I don't need to go to the doctor. Oh, that's going to take too much time. Uh, you know, everything's fine. Oh, uh, it, it's all bullshit. Okay. The, like, you you prepare for your future. You, you know, like, have a 401k or whatever. You fucking, like, have a savings account. You do this for the future. So if you're willing to do that for the future, make sure your shit ain't fucking broke you know, for your future and for your family's future, for your kid's future, for your loved one's future. You know what I'm saying? It's important. So make whatever appointments you need to make. Do it today. And if you do do this, leave it in the comments down below. Okay? Or like send me an email. Say like, you know what? You're right. I fucking went and got fingered. Okay? Let me know what this is. Let me know that you fucking hit someone up to talk to him. I see a therapist once a week. It's fine. Okay. So with all that said, let's let's turn this into something fucking pointless like poetry. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Um, so with all of that said, guys, on with the show. I've tried a few different kinds of workshops. I don't have an MFA. Mm -hmm. um, I I was originally going to go to college and take that route. Um, but I, I kind of had a thing to where my parents were like, um, you know what, if you want to do that, we'll support you emotionally, but we're not going to support you financially for that. <laughs> and if, if you want to do something more like a STEM degree type thing, and you have a plan for how you're going to use it, we'll, we'll support you financially with that. Um, but if you want to go the whole creative writing route, um, mm -hmm. you'll get our best wishes. <laughs> and probably if I had pushed it, they probably would have ended up helping me yeah. do that anyway. But um, I'm like at least half glad that that was the case because, you know, listening to to other people like Matthew talk, it doesn't seem like is that good. They don't, now, that being said, you know, people like Matthew and Andrew can say it's, you know, it's better not to get an MFA or whatever, but it's undeniable that it does give you a lot of networking and a lot of oh, people yeah. to be connected with. <laughs> and if it seemed, you know, a lot of the people who are going to be recognized in the writing, the literary world mm -hmm. have had some kind of background like that. So it's an obvious hurdle that you've got to get over if you're someone like me trying to get into writing and trying to get into poetry and the literary world not to have it um but i didn't go that route i i did a minor in english in college mm -hmm. but that's all i did uh but after after college i've tried to be a part of a few workshops but i haven't to be honest with you i haven't enjoyed any of them um yeah. there were three in particular that i tried to be a part of one was a local one here <laughs> and um, they were nice, um, and I learned some things from it. It was when I was first getting into poetry seriously and was mm -hmm. looking for something to help me learn just how to do it, how to network, how to get published, all those kind of things. Yeah. But and it's not surprising because of the demographic down here, but it was mostly retirees mm -hmm. um, and people like that. And so their viewpoint was just not 
in line with mine really and yeah. the energy of it was um Low. you know i mean they were really mostly just doing it for hobbies yeah uh, but some of them had some of them had mfas and were had been part of the literary world or still were to some significant degree and i they were just into the, just the things that they worshipped were things that i did not worship you know yeah. um and they were into some things that would probably make people laugh too like of course there a lot of them loved and worshiped Neruda <laughs> yeah like you know which I never understood and then why, some of them why is it like super old people dig <laughs> Neruda so much I think it's the same thing as the Ginsburg type scene they loved him right didn't they I don't hear any whenever I meet like some like I don't want to say like a gray hair but like somebody in like their 60s or 70s let's say yeah like Pablo fucking Neruda, like yeah, that's, dude. that's the fucking shit. Like no one fucking brings up Ginsburg. To I, me, dude. Yeah, and that was so funny that Matthew had a podcast about it the other day because I was like, I hadn't heard anybody talk about him in a long time. Yeah, but at the same time, he is popular enough. Like, there's been at least one Hollywood movie made about him in the past, and mm -hmm. you know, I mean, stuff like that. But. Yeah, I, I never, I, I've never read any of his poems that I liked. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Then others of them were really into Billy Collins and wanted to be Billy Collins, basically. Yeah. Because I guess he's the only famous poet, current contemporary poet that they knew of that um, they thought they could try to emulate or something like that. And you know, he's he's a lot more of the corny line. And you know, a lot of boomers like him, I suppose. He definitely has that boomer energy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was it was um it was good. I learned some things from it, but I I had to leave it because it was I, I you know, I just I didn't feel like I was getting anything out of it. Then there were a couple others that I tried to join. And it just seemed like the whole purpose everybody was coming to it was just to promote their own poetry. Yeah. And but the problem is also they were doing it so weakly, yeah. kind of like I need to be discovered, but I'm not going to put that much work into it. And also, I'm not going to put hmm. really very much work into building friendships with people. Yeah. And and that's the whole reason I really the main reason I ever wanted to join any workshop was try to build friendships with people. Yeah. And it seems like I never did get that yeah. out of out of the workshops. So my my experiences with them hasn't been good. Yeah, I met one amazing poet who I still talk to through that whole thing. I mean, there are other ways to network because it, it seems to me that really the only benefit, at least now, is the networking aspect of it. But there are there are other ways to do it. You know, I mean. Yeah, it's just it it is harder, I think, but it costs it, a heck of a lot less money. Yeah, no, it's it's way harder. And the thing I have been like wrestling with is, um, this is kind of stupid, and I'm I've never said this out loud to anybody before, but like, <laughs> I think I'm gonna take that same money that somebody would have put into getting schooling. To just getting a fucking publicist have That's them make sure like i'm in fucking like magazines i'm in fucking newspapers i'm in fucking like getting interviewed here and there making sure my stuff is getting in front of people because if they're gonna be too fucking snooty to even fucking talk to me i'm gonna yeah. make sure that like they can't go a day without hearing my name or seeing my face <laughs> you know like yeah that's the yeah. that's the fucking plan right now well the thing is like I feel like one of the things I think about is that any any progress that's made in, in say like in an art scene yeah. in an art form that could be totally set back by say society falling or something like that mm -hmm. right civilization falling that's not evolutionary progress and um uh this whole the whole mfa thing i think is failing it see, feels to me like everything will reset back to the way things have been in the past yeah. you know the whole idea of people being writers and making money off of only writing um it's only been rare cases yeah in, in the past um or people who are you know living uh just 
more of meager lives or whatever totally. i suppose yeah uh, but you know you look at all the hit you know all the writers of the the quote-unquote canon or whatever and most of them were either they had money from somewhere or they were real hustlers yeah um, you know and i i know that's i know that's where you take your kind of cues from is more that side of things but the whole yeah. idea of of going to school going to college getting a degree because you got that degree you get a job writing mm -hmm. and you don't really have to hustle a lot you just kind of sit back and write i mean i feel like that's how a lot of people think it works that might have been true for what a few decades yeah well maybe post world war ii a few decades yeah like i think that 80s was probably the last of that but because of that the last of that were the relics from decades prior yeah. you know and then but like i feel like um journalism was the thing that got a lot of these people like writing gigs that were paying yeah you know and you definitely became the because I mean, even fucking Hemingway was fucking writing articles or reviews or some shit. Yeah, hundreds and hundreds of yeah. them. Yeah, but like Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah, you know, and like, but he did it in a way where it's like his journalism became his shtick. Yeah, you know, and like Thomas Wolfe and all these motherfuckers. But again, too, like the thing that cracks me up about people coming from money, who were the famous writers. <laughs> they, they were the ones who were actually getting paid for their writing and they didn't even fucking yeah. money it's just like it's like oh man you guys are really fucking this up for everybody here well i mean part of it comes if you feel like you already have your needs met you're much yeah. more willing to take risks and i mean I, that's the big part you've talked about this before i mean you have to be willing to take the risks yeah because because it's not like taking the risk is not available to you Mm -hmm. um but if you if you don't have a comfortability enough to take that jump yeah without without feeling you know that you're going to be able to put food in your mouth or if you have a wife and kids put yep. food in their mouths then you're not going to do it i think and, honestly if anyone's listening to this that has a wife and kids or has a husband and kids or anything yeah. like that whatever art form you're gonna go do make sure it's an art form that actually has a lot of money behind it <laughs> you know because like honestly so not like, poetry <laughs> yeah yeah you might want to steer away from poetry for a little bit but like i was making movies when i was exactly. married with a kid or kids yeah i wouldn't have been able to support them off of just being in a band you yeah. know but doing the band and making the movies like we had a yeah. very good life for yeah like, a good 12 years yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and um so, I mean, I, I'm glad that you're out here trying to dispel for people this whole idea of the suffering artist and everything. I, I think that's a good thing. Um, for me, I personally am glad that I have a job to rely on, yeah. especially through COVID. I mean, COVID would have been a lot scarier for me and my family if if I hadn't had that job to rely on. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, it was during COVID that I really amped up my writing even more than I ever had before. Yeah. So I think everybody does have to find their own path for it. Mm -hmm. um, you, you just have to, you really have to go for it. That's the, all I know. I mean, the, the plus I had with COVID was people weren't working, but people were still coming up with money to buy books. Yeah. Because they had a lot of fucking downtime, you know? To read, and yeah. So, so I reissued every book I had out at that moment, like at that time. Um, yeah. And was just really pushing like my ebook fiction and stuff like that and um so that was kind of i don't want to say like the last big boom i had through that but i mean it wasn't kindle gold rush level but like the books fucking helped through covid for sure and it goes back to having a backlist like yeah. the big the bigger your backlist is the more opportunities you have to fucking make a couple bucks oh yeah and that's true i'm i um because I grew up playing music. Um, I never was in a band at the same level you were, but I grew up um, in the Ozarks playing bluegrass, folk, country, oh, all awesome. that kind of gospel yeah. music. And that was one big thing that every professional musician ever said is know a ton of that, you know, know a ton of songs, have a yeah. huge backlog of music. Yeah. If you, if you are ever to make it, 
then you'll have plenty to rely on. And so as soon as I got serious about writing, I just started writing tons of stuff. And now in the last couple of years, both with writing criticism, writing essays, writing poems, even now I'm starting to get more into short stories. I am starting to be a little more successful at that. Yeah. And I have quite a quite a big backlist of material that I can send out to places or, you know, things that I've started on, like hundreds yeah. of poems, essays, and other kind of things that I've started on. I have notes for short stories, things yeah. like that, that I can work on and and get out in submissions and things like that. So yeah, that's absolutely essential. Yeah. Like if there's like advice from this, I think it would be a lot of people worry about putting out that first book and they're always yeah. like, oh, I don't, I, I don't want it to like be like self-published or like, I just don't want that, like that stigma, which I don't think exists really anymore, but like um, or at least how it used to. And um, just, I want it to be perfect. Like as soon as you pop that cork yeah. and like get a book out, it is so easy to get more books out. Um, yeah. But like, you'll never know like how to do anything or if anyone gives a shit unless you yeah. fucking put that book out. Yeah. So that's always the thing. Yeah. But, but like with what you're saying about um, when I went to Florida to stay with my family out there for a summer, um, I was 14 and I had been playing bass for like maybe two years. And what they would do on Sundays is they would, because they were shrimpers, they would get all the like crawfish and shrimp and all the shit they got and have like a big fucking like party like under the fucking house because <laughs> all their houses are on stilts and shit yeah so like we would go under the house and like they would be cooking up shit tons of food and all the people in the neighborhood like played an instrument and yeah. this one day the guy who played bass wasn't there and so my like cousin or uncle i don't know like what his relation is to me but he's like um play you play bass pick up the bass i'm like i don't know what you're doing and he's like just follow along and like I was like forced into this situation and I learned more that day than I did yeah. in three years of taking lessons. Like, and the stuff I learned that day, I still use today when I'm playing or writing. Oh yeah, definitely. Like it was the most, and it was like kind of like a bluegrass um, band that they had. That was the most crucial musical moment in my life. Yeah. Like I learned more that day. It was crazy. Yeah. The kind of version I had of that is almost, it seems like just about every weekend, but at least a few times a month, they would have things around where I grew up called singings. They call uh -huh. them. It'd be at a church and it would basically be just like, usually like a Saturday night thing to where anyone could come and sing and play music. Of course, yeah. it's mostly focused around like Christian music and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but there's plenty of that in the bluegrass country yeah. gospel folk tradition and they would go on for hours and if you were one of the kind of the main ones at the church there you would be up there providing support for all these people who wanted to come and come up and sing but couldn't play an instrument and a yeah. lot of times these people could not sing <laughs> you know what i mean or it's like karaoke before karaoke yeah. <laughs> yeah so you would have to you'd have to improvise you would have to try to figure out the song you'd have to work around them yeah very um jazz like almost mm -hmm. at times of course in a much different vein but um yeah you learned a lot and you know i don't really play music that much anymore unless i'm with my family or something like that yeah. but a lot of those kind of musical techniques or ideas i try to put into my writing now yeah yeah so it's good i, I think it's good for people to be a part of that totally. but I think when I went out looking for workshops or open mics, I think that's kind of what I was looking for is sort of that vibe, you know, like you're talking about playing with all, music with all those people yeah. or I think that's sort of what I was looking for, but I have, I, to be honest, I've just not found it really in, mm -hmm. in any in-person kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think like, for instance, the group that you have with the Anarchy Crew is a lot mm. closer to it. Yeah. Um, but it, it's 
I don't know. Like in st some of the stuff, for instance, that Alice describes being in Australia, that seems a lot closer to mm -hmm. what I've always been looking for. Yeah. But I haven't real. found it in person here. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck our problem is here. Like, it's just, it's not something that seems to be, and that's why I was like, I'm going to open a bookstore and I'm going to have like a cafe in it and like be able to do all this shit. But then again, like you need to have a lot of money back behind you to fucking put that together. <laughs> and you should yeah. probably have a shit ton of credit cards that you can max out back to what we were originally <laughs> talking about. <laughs> yeah. But like, I think yeah. too, like just like that idea of like throwing yourself in and like learning how to swim, yeah. like that, that is just how things work, dude. And I think that's probably, I don't know if that like fucked me up and that was just how I did everything I've done since then, but that like checks out, you know, like, yeah, well, well, I think, you know, we talk about, you know, we always tease about how poetry doesn't have any money in it. And I know that you, you work against that stereotype as much as you possibly can. But, you know, a lot of the people who are successful in the literary world, poetry uh -huh. world, like, like you or um, like Matthew had on Slavery because a while back, Ernie Hilbert, uh, people yeah. like that, they sort of have more of this mindset that we're talking about. This just get in there and get thrown in and try to swim and hustling and trying to promote yourself and all these different kind of things. Yeah. And Ernie came from music too. And I think yeah, that has did, yeah. a lot to do with it, dude. And I got one of his do, yeah. magnets up on the fridge right there. You know, oh, yeah. like, did, did yeah. you go check his stuff out? Yeah, he sent me a bunch of stuff. And um, oh. I, I want to talk and I sent him a bunch of stuff, but we haven't talked since we did the exchange. So I want to oh, hit gotcha. him up and um, kind of pick his brain on some shit. But yeah, um, yeah cool like, dude. his magnet game is fucking amazing. <laughs> like that, that's brilliant. I gotta yeah. Get on that. yeah i think i think there's just um in the literary world there's just a lot of leftover decadence <laughs> yeah you could go a lot of leftover i i don't know i i haven't been in it enough to know exactly what it is but there's a lot of instead of looking for money they're looking for prestige you know uh -huh. i mean that's something that a lot of people have talked about um and you know they talk about looking down on doing things like magnets or or some yeah, t-shirts yeah. and stuff like that but dude if you I gotta, come from the music world you yeah. don't think like that no I mean, it's even just, jazz it's artists put out stuff like that yeah because it's like like in doing the documentary like we had this whole thing about that i'm like like why would i expect anyone out there to wear one of my t-shirts or something if i'm not willing to wear it myself like yeah. like motherfuckers need to promote and they need to promote themselves and not feel dumb about doing it you yeah. know i don't want to like pull the fucking curtain back on the wizard but yeah <laughs> something like that <laughs> yeah it seems like that's the case yeah but i mean i'm i'm definitely not a success i'm i mean i'm working toward it but it's not um it's something i'm working toward and i mean you know i work a full-time job just like a lot of people do and I also have a family and other yeah. commitments. And so I have to decide how to balance it. Yeah. How to balance the writing. And I and I deal with a thing a lot to where I anytime I'm writing, I kind of feel guilty because the writing that I'm doing is not really bringing in much, if any, money. And I'm just trying to work toward it. And I mean, writing is something I feel if I don't write, it's like I'll go crazy. Yeah, you know? totally. Like I hear that. And I just heard this um like not that I'm like thinking like everyone should go listen to everything Warren Buffett has to say but <laughs> there was this um, quote where someone asked him like what's the best investment that you've made and he's like well any investment that's an investment in myself those are the ones that always pay off and so as like a writer like okay like when you're writing stuff that isn't bringing in you money right now like just look at it as like this is bringing in this is me bringing money in when I am yeah. retired. This is money yeah. coming in ten years. This is money coming yeah. in twenty years. And just That's a good way to look, look at, at it, it yeah. like that, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, my my wife and my family, there's totally support of me, mm -hmm. but I I just I I feel guilty about it sometimes. So it, working through that guilt can be kind of a funny thing. Yeah, um, and just for the reason of feeling like is this even worth it but i really liked what you said about it um 
but then also choosing, like I choose to do a lot of poetry. I could focus more on writing like critical work about say movies because mm. I can get paid off that more easily. Yeah. Um, so I, I haven't discovered that magic balance. That's for sure. Um, I kind of just go with whatever I'm feeling like writing yeah, at the got, moment. You got to follow the muse, dude. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that's, that's pretty much what I do. So you have, you're going to be in the bloodshed review in November. Yeah. Looking forward to it. And you've been in the blood rag a couple of times. Yeah. And you have, are you putting your book out this Christmas? Is that so actually, um, yeah, it's actually out right now on Amazon. Um, but I haven't sent it out to any of the people I want to send copies to because I wanted to wait at least until November to do that because it's, it's, you know, Christmas and winter themed. And I I didn't want to be that person playing Christmas music in October, you know? (laughs) Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, it's going to be my first chat book. I mean, I, Technically, I put out some homemade chat books when I was in high school um, just for fun, but only never more than a dozen yeah. of them. But uh, th- those were fun to do. But this is my first chat book that I'm going to have come out with uh, post high school, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I was kind of waiting to do it until after I'd come out with the first book. but. I don't know when that's going to happen. I was just going to ask, like, do you, have you heard any other stuff on that? Some, and I'm not really sure what's going to happen with it. I really have no idea. So I, you know, I was waiting for that, but especially, you know, you're always saying, put it out. So kind of inspired by that, I went ahead and did it. It's a thing that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Good. Um, just a chat book of, 12 Christmas poems, Christmas and winter related poems. Um, and actually it's a total of 14 in it because I sort of have an introduction and conclusion one. And each poem is matched up with a painting or a picture of some kind. Oh, cool. I actually have have a copy of it right here beside me. You know, like people listening to it can't hear it, but if they're on the video, this is the it's oh, a shit. five by seven. Nice. The smallest you can print on Amazon. I did it through Amazon. And um so let me show you like an exemplary poem and picture pairing. Like there's so on one page oh, cool. you have the a picture or a painting, and yeah. on the other page a poem. Nice. So that's the layout of it. So I tried to do it really carefully. Uh there's some free verse in there, there's some more formal verse in there as well. Um uh, but I'm copy will be headed your way come Wait. November. <laughs> It's yeah, um, looking forward to not that. necessarily the kind of poems that you are usually within your wheelhouse necessarily. But hey, um, dude, it's for the fucking season, dude. Yeah, I get. But you. yeah, it's something. It's something I wanted to put out. Like there, uh, I've, I've been wanting to do it for a few years now. So I was yeah. like, you know what, Matt is always saying, just put it out. I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> it looks really good. Yeah, I, I like thank you. you. Like, well, yeah, appreciate it. I I spent a lot of time trying. This is my first book I've ever put together, so I spent a lot of time trying to get it right. Yeah, it looks really good, dude. Thank you. Yeah, I think anyone, I think people will enjoy it for sure. Yeah. Um, I I tried to put something in there a little bit for everybody, and yet have a common thread of winter and Christmas related stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got a few copies. Um, I put it up on Amazon, and I've already had a few people buy it who I didn't mm. even know. Yeah, had a couple people leave reviews on it. Oh, sweet. Um, that I I didn't ask for those reviews to be left. I haven't even started pushing it super hard yet, but I wasn't exactly sure how the Amazon algorithm works and everything. So I felt like I may need to release it in time for the algorithm to like digest it or something. Yeah, um, it's oh, dude, it's um it's ever changing like they are constantly revamping how they do shit um but like i think because it's a christmas kind of thing um 
you probably did it right because it will still be at least keyword searchable yeah like topic wise yeah. um over the next couple months so it, yeah. it should be it should be okay yeah i'm hoping so and uh, i mean it doesn't seem like there's a huge market for this kind of thing but really the main reason i originally wanted to do it was to send to friends and family yeah and after a while i was just like well i might as well have it available for anyone to look yeah. at too if they want to buy it and a few people already have so i i think that's that's good yeah but um said it's 12 it's a total of 14 poems but 12 main ones and then everything from like classical there's a like a 16th century painting in there all the way up to like a couple of photographs like digital yeah. photographs so uh, i think people will enjoy it um whatever their disposition is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've given it to people who love poetry and they liked it and i've given it to people who pretty much never read poetry and they liked it too so. yeah it's definitely something that i could see people doing for like oh you know what we should just get this for everybody stocking yeah you know like I, that, that's that awesome. would be the idea yeah that would be the idea <laughs> yeah everyone listening no matter how many people are in your family get enough copies for everyone every single stocking yeah, yeah. There, there were really two couples that i had in mind when i put it together and that was my parents and this Mormon couple I know. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. they were kind of my target. <laughs> my target <it>. audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, there but, you, you know, go. Like, yeah. Most people never have their um, parents be the target audience for them. So that's actually really interesting. <laughs> your your books, your parents aren't your target audience for your books. Fuck oh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> like the the black star books i did um my parents both read them and really were impressed by him and were i think it took them off guard i don't i don't think they thought it was going to be anything that they would be interested in and i think they just got it originally just to like be nice kind to of thing to support yeah their and then then it was like oh because like that's the most supportive my family has ever been you know yeah. like they got those books and read that series there was a that's sex cool. scene in it my mom didn't like and like kind of gave me shit for it and i'm like okay then don't read anything else i write because <laughs> like, it only gets worse <laughs> yeah it gets way worse so just stay away from that shit how about your movies have they watched any of your movies fuck no but it was weird because <laughs> it was one christmas we all were together at my parents house and um like people were just kind of razzing me about like oh, uh -huh. he, he makes movies and all this other shit <laughs> and i'm like well fucking go on your fucking um your uh streaming pay-per-view whatever and see if any of my movies are on there because i bet you they fucking are and they did and one of them was on there and they're like oh we should watch it and i'm like actually no you shouldn't do that right now especially because it's christmas and especially because there's kids in the room so if you want to do it later and then maybe just buy it and then not even watch it that would be amazing <laughs> but i don't think you should watch it <laughs> oh that's awesome uh, yeah i walked right into fucking that one dude that's funny yeah that's awesome yeah yeah i mean a lot of my I write a wide range of poetry. Like the the other book I have been trying to get published is not like this at all. Um, the one that I've told you about, Apocalypse Stance. Yeah. It's a lot more, um, I don't know, angry. Yeah. And uh, uh, pessimistic in some regards. Um, but I mean, Christmas is a special season. I, I I've always loved Christmas and winter. Yeah. So. That's why I wanted to put it out. Well, yeah, I'll put a link to the book in the notes. Good. And I hope that... everything I fucking write, <laughs> like motherfuckers end up getting drunk and having sex and fucking enjoying themselves, <laughs> dude. Fuck. Well, because there's two, there's two schools of thought there. And I've talked to Bucks about this too, where I'm like, there are some critics who, even if like their views change, their critiques won't because they don't want yeah. anyone to ever call them out for like being a hypocrite or being wishy-washy yeah. or anything like that. And the fact that you become 
like a prisoner to your old thoughts is fucking crazy to me. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, I think you should just shoot out and explore in every direction. I mean, if my yeah. thought, if my opinion changes on something, I'm going to write it, you know, I'm not yeah. going to keep it because, you know, you always will have those people like um, there are critics that I follow. Um, and if they write something and in writing it, they praise something that before they uh -huh. criticized, you'll have people in the comments saying, Back in 2010, you wrote this review that said that this Which was is so horseshit. crazy. Yeah. And what pisses me off about that is that that just proves the death of the author is bullshit. Mm -hmm. All of these critics who think that. the death of the author should be the fucking thing, but are being held hostage by readers from like 10 years ago telling you when you're a hypocrite. Like, yeah. It's such fucking a joke, dude. Yeah. Oh my I mean, fucking I, god. One of the biggest things people always say is like they don't want to be hypocrites. And I I get that. But yeah. I mean, to me, hypocrisy is not the greatest sin. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's worse that you're hiding your hypocrisy. Yeah. Like if, because we're all hypocrites of some kind. We're all yeah. gonna have conflict. That's being a human. Yeah. And honestly, when I change my views on something like you were saying you write it i get excited and i fucking tell everybody yeah i'm like oh my gosh i had this epiphany i was wrong yeah. this whole fucking time <laughs> yeah and and i'm of the opinion that a writer doesn't if they change their mind they don't even need in my opinion they don't have to justify yeah. that why they've changed their mind yeah. they just need to write they need to write as well as they can about it yeah um but oh my god yeah people want to get so nitpicky about it and to me that's just that's so uninteresting to get nitpicky like that about it so thank you so much for doing this it was fun hanging out with you man we should do yeah, it man. and that was our talk with ethan mcguire again um there will be links down below for you to check out his book um he will also be in bloodshed review number four coming out later this month um, he's also been in um, a few issues of the Blood Rag, like this one here. I mean, he's not in this one, I don't think. No. Um, this is issue 16. This is October's issue. Issue 17 will be out shortly. But in issue 16 here, we have poems from Keith Phillips, Jeff Taylor, Jason White, um, Brad Crownover, QG Pennyworth, Gabby Gilliam, me and adam crawford um and there will be an episode with jeff coming up here very shortly um either shit in like two episodes um i have a interview with jeff on here so anyway so you could get um blood rag free um on my website i hate um slash the dash blood dash rag or with any um, purchase on my Etsy shop, you can also get a free copy of the blood rag and you could get my newest chat book, abnormal brain um, over on my Etsy shop right now. And this has, I think 17 poems. We said something like that. 17 poems. There are only 13 copies of this and only the first six are signed. Okay. So these are numbered and the first um, six are signed. So run on over and grab that as soon as you can, because if you don't, everything will go to shit. Okay. So, um, oh, and then I also have been doing my um, ebook um, bombardment on Amazon. Pharma Phoenix Rises, um, Poems About Fucking, and 13 Miles South of Hell are up now. And I think Mart will be up probably by Thursday or Friday, okay? So there is that. And are those all the butt plugs? In the next episode, we will be answering a few more questions that I either missed or didn't get to and just do some like mainly um, listener feedback and stuff like that, okay? So um, with all of that said, everybody, join the Anarchy Crew. Um, go to my YouTube page, um, get on that so you could do weekly workshops with me and the rest of the crew, okay? So keep buying my books, type hard, everybody, and I will talk to you all later.
Just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.